I'm, I'm really loud, so unless you say I need to use the mic, I can you can hear me? I hope I don't end up using the mic as a pointer. <laughs> okay, so what Jay did is actually show that the power of Jay, what I said in the workshop talk was what genetics allows you to do is to look at who you look at. And what Jane has illustrated through her talk is the power of using genetic approaches to solve a specific question, and that question is one of our senses of them. So I am going to take a similar approach to address the question of axon transport. So in an axon transport, as you already know, multiple particles are highly between the cell body and the synapse. Okay? And a major carbon for the neurons is the <laughs> the beautiful electron microglass, which are filled with synaptic vessels, right? And these synaptic vessels are carrying neurotransmitter whose release at synaptic sites allows this neuron to communicate with the postsynaptic cell, be that another muscle or another neuron. That allows me to move my hand and to the hand. This is a microphone to hold it close to my mouth. Axon transport is necessary in all neurons and is fundamental for the formation and function of the nervous system of which the brain is part. And defects in axon transport, as you've seen, especially in this week and as well as last week, have been implicated in several neurodegenerative diseases such as MS. But it is an intrinsically interesting problem since it needs to work well for efficient movement of power between the site of synthesis and a major site of function, the synapse. So when you're looking at axonal transport of synaptic vesicles, the major motor that has been identified is the release of change. In multiple systems, <coughs> CRNAs. In fact, in fact, I said in, the, in, in my workshop talk that this was a very nice paper which showed a motor cargo registration, a one to one motor cargo registration for you know, a very important cargo. In that early study by Hunt and Hedgehog, reductions or loss of this motor in instant three led to accumulation of vesicles in the cell body and loss of vesicles in the synapse. And it's a very, very clear phenotype. You know, if you look at it, what first struck me was that it was a precursor product relationship with the enzyme nature. Subsequently, other people have looked at other systems, for instance, in Drosophila, as well as the recovery is looked at that is done at the Bill Saxton's lab, as well as uh, John Schwartz's lab. And you recover made by smoking, in all of those cases, lack of the kinesis reporter led to significant reduction of synaptic vesicles and synapses. And essentially, only in the CRNA case, you see a very clear precursor product relationship with accumulation of sample. So, if you look at this specific cargo and sort of break up the process into multiple steps, what might you expect would happen? You need to make a transport carrier, which has a complement of proteins on it, synaptic principal proteins, some examples of which you saw in Ishijen's talk, which was using synaptic ready cook to GFP. You of course need to have the motor, which is also synthesized from the cell body. You need to have the motor brought to a complex form. That needs to enter in the axon because synaptic principles actually end up at the end, you know, at synapses in the presynaptic side. They're not entering the neurons. So you need to have some mechanism to put them into the right subcellular domain. Of course, if you remember the neurons that we have seen throughout, uh, throughout the workshop as well as the school, you have a long distance to move. So you want consistent motion. You don't want a vesicle to do this and then wait around for 15 minutes or an hour or a day, right? You just want it to move in a persistent fashion along my particular tracks, maybe dissociate from it, this is motor wood, hop on, switch tracks, 
should recognize that he has got to the synapse, and that's actually a very important problem. When we had some insights to that problem from Scott Brady's talk, you know that you have come to the synapse, especially in all person synapses, release your cargo, and then finally, presumably there is some free motor that needs to be regulated, and then you need to do the same process again, taking subsets of cargo back to the cell phone. So this is, you know, this is sort of a deconstruction of what yeah, as you didn't say, it's pretty well said. You want to get the unit of the steps in a process, and this is a cartoon diagram of some of the unit steps. There are probably many more. Okay. So critically, what they know, they know that the tendency to run on a promoter in multiple systems is important for moving vesicles from this from the cell body out into the axon. It might not be the only motor. In fact, there is certainly evidence to suggest that things from one and another things can also play a role. But I think nobody would argue with the fact that things is a very important motor for synaptic vesicle transport. In fact, you know, think about it, I think Phoenician C as a specialist and Phoenician Y as a generalist, which can have multiple functions. Okay? This is one study which looks at um, how is the motor linked to its cargo, which shows that A3 or DEN, which is a gap for graphically, is uh, important for attaching the motor to the cargo, and that does not seem to hold true in at least one other system. More recently, Kang has shown that R8 is very important for making sure that the vesicles in the proximal axons don't aggregate with each other and can actually, the activity of this is important for making sure vesicles can proceed. And of course, there's been a study by Vijay uh, Kokinsan and one of the band, which shows that SIG2, which we just heard about, is extremely important for synapse assembly, is also required for controlling the accessibility of the motor. So we have some players involved, more of them are coming, but we still don't have a very good deconstruction of what are all the molecular players and what they contribute to this entire process. So big questions, like the Saxon said, right? So you've been saying that throughout the talk. So big questions that I am interested in and I think the people who are interested in is basically to find molecules and mechanisms governing the multiple steps that I showed you. Okay, so what are the molecular mechanisms? What are the relations of the multiple steps in modern motor cargo? And because in part actually, while I'm interested in this question, what's really interesting is to look at animals under a microscope and so then intrinsically any process that you change, you want to know what its contribution is to the neuronal development or neuronal function. How central are these molecules that you find for the function of the nervous system? It's transport, you know, like the person who just every day comes and just finishes in your house, or is it that if the finish doesn't come, your house is in the corner? Right, so it's a very crude analogy, and but that's sort of some of the things that I'm interested in. So how did I approach this question when I started my lab? Is to take a genetic analysis, and I want to get at multiple steps of this process, and I'll tell you two stories, um, one unpublished and one published, which begin to give us a little bit of insight into what might be going on. So, question for soon. You just saw Jen explain how you can design a screen, and no one people who had that also. Um, how you can design a screen, to look at molecules that affect synapse formation. So I want you to think about a genetic approach where what would you look for if you're looking for a mutant in which you wanted to get molecules involved in synaptic vesicle transport? What would you say? In you know, which of the things? Okay. So there is something else. I mean, you remember when when she said that when you see a you just see you look at something which is not moving, right? Because you don't have synapses to the synapses you do not move, but you can get a lot of things which are just muscle movements, right? You don't want muscle movements. So 
That's just a method. What would you look for? What was the phenotype of Kampana? Oh, Accumulation in the cell body, right? So you could look for means in which vesicles, instead of being at the synapse, were stuck in the cell body, right? And there were so many labs doing screens using a marker which was present on mature synaptic vesicles and synaptic credit. We should take my former boss, Mark Tone, and Cory Bar. And they were all looking for mutants that alter distributions of synaptic vesicles. Then they would also get mutants which would make these vesicles be stuck in the cell body, right? There were very few. In all of this case, everybody got the key sensory motor, and they got all these useful molecules, say, two, RPM1, and one. But it did appear that you were getting a large number of players that were involved in the transport process. So, as I finished my postdoc, I decided to read on to the do yes. And then, so if you remember one of the talks in the school, the police in the tail, Differs, so there's over 60 cranes, and each of them has slightly different tails, and the way it finds the power is very different. Right? So, this one has a pH domain in its chain, it starts to find a liquid on the left of the surface. There is evidence to suggest that it is PIP2, although PIP2 is not present in high concentration in an extra vesicle, so it could be another liquid, but certainly evidence so far suggests PIP2. Okay? So, I just want yeah. That was always that that she talked about, right? So you need to make the active flow, you need to set up a release site, and some of the papers that are going to be discussed today are in that direction. You need to set up a domain where the vessels can dock and be found. Okay? Okay, so what I wanted, what, what I reasoned was that if I took a weak case mutation, which had some vesicles, you know, sort of stuck in the cell body, but not all, because if all the vesicles are stuck in the cell body, the animal can't do anything, it's going to be dead. Right? So it has to eat and it has to grow up a little bit. And then I said, let's do the equivalent of a chemical bomb plant, right? A nuclear, let's feed it a little magnetogen and now look for double mutants in which now synaptic vesicles just came back up. So you took a sensitized mutation, so it's a suppressor stream, much like what Jim did. And I'll tell you what the character is. You take a sensitized genetic background, you now look for second hydrogen. So what did I choose from my primary background? What I chose when I first started the screen and it was still in continuum was an original mutation which was in the cargo binding the way in the motor. And I reasoned that I wanted to fix. Somebody asked me to get the within the gene. I wanted to fix within the gene, but I also got it fixed elsewhere. What is the advantage of taking such an approach? You have the potential to identify novel molecules, but also novel functions of known molecules which can import on this particular process. Right? So, what about microdonations? You might be triple complexity. You can, but then you have to make sure that you do the right transcription of the NS, and in subsequent process, you make sure that it takes action. That is enough. Because in the process, after the it has a big test, it might be a simulator in the cell body. It is, right? You know, when you first execute it, because you have got the original system, you have the system in the cell body, and now you have a second system, which now, together, it will be dragged the cell body. So, instead of setting there, maybe, so everything will get mutated, but then you sort it out afterwards in the process to make sure that you're fit test for it. Okay? So what might you expect to get? So considering because I did the cargo, what I thought was the cargo binding defect, 
and subsequently my student details are shown by the cloud provider data, is you will get compensatory changes if your motor is not able to buy a cargo bed and a motor that buys a cargo bed. Right? You can get compensations by other motor systems. I said, please, and when was it not? So if you don't have as much capacity, maybe you can increase the level of police and one and buy a cargo bed. Hard annotations to get, but still possible. Or decrease rates of brake transport to make sure you reach in more of the experts that come up. And you can also get, because of the way this scheme is designed, changes in how you make your cargo. What's your market? You're looking at an African specialty market GFP with some protein. You just put that protein in some other transport carrier, you would get what are visually suppressions. Of course, we had a two part scheme that did behave as well, but nonetheless. Right. Yeah. So what about the yeah. addition and regulation? Uh, no matter if you know how much you have, have the defective cargo by the motor, you're going to be able to So, I'm going to describe one of these uh, genes that we cloned, which was uh, in, uh, in another thing, which will be able to reverse this phenotype. And that was called a protein called GIP3. GIP3 has a long and illustrious history. It was first identified, I think, I think by, um, oh, I've not put a paper, I apologize. The GIP3 was identified, I think, by Tristan Burke, and he's important for transport, but it was also identified by the member right that wrote a baby chat that the sample is the junk kinases, right? It's all of these kinases that bind to GIP3, which are important for scaffolding. Very important stress There's been subsequently evidence from multiple labs that suggest that GIP3 might be an adapter for attaching the police in one motor to a cargo vesicle, probably even synaptic vesicle. And there was data from Dan Goldstein's lab, Dr. Valley, that suggested that GIP3 bound to the network. So the minute we identified that it was GIP3, we were not happy. Right, because it's, it's very confusing picture. So you've removed GIPS, you've removed the police and three motor, what have you done? Have you now reduced police in one transport? Or have you reduced double transport? What, you know, why do you be able to put more vesicles as the asthma? But if you're a good geneticist, the first question you ask is, you know, maybe, like you said, it's just increasing the level of the police and three motor, so you can take vesicles out. So, what we did was to take the null mutation that completely there's no PC3 motor at all. We actually showed that there was no protein coming from the token. And then you make a double mutant here that's all away from, from the Brenner lab. And what you saw was in the vesicles being stuck in the cell body, in this atom of Lisa, so you look at it now, you have a large vesicle coming up. By the similar observations were published by the Jin lab. Okay, so we knew. Go back to first principles, never assume anything just because of the mutation you made. The compensatory changes that could hold a poorly functional from the cargo were not possible. We did a lot of experiments to show that, and you can go into that if you want, that it was not other people's <coughs> vesicles. So what remained, that Sherlock Holmes would say, you exhausted all the other possibilities. Whatever remains, however unlikely, is the most thing that's going to be the truth. So we thought that we had changes upstream in the way we were making the transport bed. And our first clue in that direction came not only from observations that Jim had published in two different papers primarily, but also from our own imaging analysis. So what I'm going to show you now, if I can get this working, is transport of synaptic vesicles in the touch neuron. You have these little pumps that are moving either towards the synapse or back away from the synapse, right? And there are also some vesicles that don't move, which you heard about from her. But what happened when we can't make these movies, you see these larger fiber compartments that came to not like this point, so you just watch, it's slightly bigger, but now you will see a humongous one come out from the cell. Okay? It's just enormous compared to what we saw. We saw that repeatedly you could catch that in final graphs as big, broad, fat, broad lines compared to these sharp point lines. We just saw that by electron microscopy confirmed further 
one gene can already be published, that you have larger systemic present in axons, you have larger vesicles. And these vesicles could move independently of the kinesin 3 module or the kinesin 1 module, these big large tubes. And genetically it shown such that when you make a kinesin 3 double <coughs> with gypsum, you get carbon in the synapse. These vesicles are able to bypass another regulation of RNA. So the absence of RNA, the absence of RNA vesicles, synaptic vesicles are stuck in the cell body. But RNA double motors in G3, these vesicles are able to bypass the activity of RNA and go all the way up to the synapse. Putting all of these operations together, we reason that G3 must have a function in the cell body. What is if you if G3 has a function in the cell body? Perhaps it's present in the cell body in specific locations. Indeed, that is what we saw using genes rescue answer and looking at her images. We found that you know, that was really like the Goji. So it's probably the Goji. So we saw that there was certainly some gypsy that whole of life is a Goji model. Okay? If gypsy is present on the Goji model, is it that only one kind of transport carriers is affected, or are there multiple things which go wrong? And in fact, we saw that multiple things went wrong. For instance, here what we're looking at is a Golgi resident Golgi enzyme called CLA transcase GFP. Normally it's restricted to the cell body and to type function. What happens in gene 3 mutants is it breaks down into multiple little dots that you see in the cell body and it sort of fills up the entire axon, even going up to the cell. And another one for instance, the same thing, transcase 2 GFP. And by the time it is needed of dying mutants, these points, I wish I could tell you, it could be that there are multiple Golgi or there are multiple vesicles formed from the primary Golgi which now are the molecules, which is like the most conservative explanation. But what it repeatedly brought us to is gypsy, a canonical molecule, which is a giant molecule, scattering molecule, which also is important for kinesin one adapting to carbon and for dying, you know, dying based regulation has a normal and I don't think we could have uncovered this easily except that we took a genetic approach. Right? And I want to again give credit that we were not the first people to make these observations. We saw that in James paper from this head of Brown, that they had indeed noted that the secondary localization of a Golgi marker was altered in the NBA that we found in their lab for James Reed in a completely different way. So, what have we added to the field so far? We had confirmed a bunch of genes observations. We had said we have this one new phenotype that we have seen these large attributed carriers from the cell body, and much like what has been shown for the mouse G3 or Sunday driver, as it's called, that it is present in Golgi derived. We did get ahead in trying to understand A, why it was suppressing a follicle and what it really was doing. Apart from all of other functions, which I know it's already doing, but for giving rise to the skin types. So I told the class that what we need to do is maybe find another thing which has a similar phenotype. And why did we need to do the kind of suppressive screen that we did? We didn't want to spend so much time, so we did a little bit of cheating. We knew that G3 mutants had defects such that they put synaptic vesicle markers in cells. So completely broken down the ability to put the right kind of transport carrier in the right place. We wanted to argue that the formation of the transport carrier was messed up. Okay? So we said, what are these other molecules which can be more effective? We screened through two or three what are considered polarity molecules and identified one. LRK, which is last one, and for the CN, the formula of the familiar Parkinsonian Parkinsonian gene, not two. It's very complex, very big, much like Jim, one of how many domains. And what was interesting for us is apart from the prior similarity, which was published and which we had also noticed, it gave us these large tubular carriers moving in the asthma. Both by, by using two different markers for synaptic We then did all the classic genetic experiments. We said, okay, let's make double mutants between GIF3, uh, between GIF3 and LARP1. And they all didn't get much worse. So maybe so, you know, 
sort of made the broken system of gypsy pretty much as much as we can. In addition, it seemed that every phenotype of the life one gene was a suspect of the gyp gene, right? The gyp gene mutation. In that, even in life one, you got resident gold enzymes coming out of the axon, not as much or as severely as the gyp gene mutation. The cell body was largely intact, and you didn't have this fragmentation that can be seen in more functions, but nonetheless, there was similarity. So the geneticists wouldn't say when you look at this, say, okay, you are reaching the same endpoint, but you could come different ways. I thought the body of hundreds and thousands of proteins. That's not what you consider. You don't consider the fact that LARC1, as in the gypsy, certain on the Goji, and the other similar phenotypes, does not mean necessarily that actually the same So then we did this experiment using a LARC1 rescue construct that we got from Nalokiza. We asked a very simple question. What does it do to the gypsy phenotypes? Right? So you have wild type animals in which now we're looking at a different marker. We're looking at a dendritic marker, which is present at the tip of the dendrite or the transient When you look at gypsy mutants, it gets out into the axon. In non-human mutants, it looks like wild type. Now, you over it, it's not going to approach it, still messed up. Now, you look at the synaptic vector. Synaptic vector in wild type only present in the axon in gypsy mutants and not in the dendrite. When you overexpress large, you are now able to prevent the mixed trafficking of this transport carrier. Mm -hmm. And you are able to prevent the formation of these large tubes. If you overexpress large things, you are able to suppress them. That gave us the first genetic evidence that both of these might be acting together. Then we went on to do a little bit of biochemistry where we immunofacilitated using rescue contracts again, this is James line and this is uh, Nalkin line, we were able to immunoprecipitate LARC and pull down GYP3, we immunoprecipitate GYP3 and pull down LARC, given this some confidence that both of these are not going to be not going to circuit and get to put together. And last but not the least, when we look at gypsy mutants, we find that large localization is somewhat altered. In fact, another protein called, which is an adapter complex, which is important for making cargo from the Golgi to the right side, is also this, this localization is disturbed. So the picture that begins to emerge, just hold on this one, we get back to transport. Okay? The picture that begins to emerge that it's possible that gypsy and large are present together, and you can see they have put something else in between, I don't know what that something else is, is present on the Golgi, acting like a molecular fence, preventing misworking of proteins. Okay, so that resident Golgi in fact stay in the Golgi, and they don't come out into the axon. And now we make proper little vessels in normal animals, which can recruit in the three and grow out their business. When you remove GIP3, you lose an aspect of the Golgi retention or some sort of recycling. We think the most persimilant explanation that happens at the Golgi is codacted at an endosome. But what happens is several things go wrong. Maybe if you're not putting the adapter complex properly in the axon, you now start getting a longer tube. But you also do not retain the Golgi enzyme. You mix up all your proteins, and now you are able to recruit different kinds of models. It doesn't matter anymore whether you go by Kinesin 3 or Kinesin 1, you just put any kind of water in it, you lose cargo selectivity because your cargo is messed up, and now something goes out of the axon. And because you have some copy of the synthetic proteins going out into the axon, you show up as a suppressor for the motor. So, what happens in LARP when you lose LARP 2? Obviously, it seems to be a much less severe phenotype. It seems to be that if you can know that possibly the Golgi is a lot of large, you can buy something with the GIP3, and the phenotypes are much deeper. We don't completely understand it, but I think what it tells you is that you need to make a proper transport carrier, and this transport carrier which is made is what is critical for putting the right motor on the proper surface. And it, of course that's sensible, because your motor is going to bind to whatever is present on your carbon surface, finally, either directly or indirectly. 
So what is the meaning of all of this for transport? Right? There's just, just you know, there's just absolutely nothing so far that's any way related to the original question I posed. Right? But I was interested, even though I came up against Egyptian and I was disappointed and I was worried because it's a complex gene, it's a complex phenotype, I was just interested in the biology because it was never clear to me what happens to the motor in vivo if it is unable to bind cargo. You can clip the, clip the cargo binding domain of a motor and ask where it partitions by making transfer of animals, but there were some mixed results and it was not clear to me what was going on. Okay, and I'm not saying that I still know what's going on. But it's clear that you need the right transport carrier to recruit motor. But we, we can't make this interesting observation, um, which I am not claiming I have a full explanation of, but both are using our rest in non common project P trans gene and our antibody, we actually showed that that the motor, any sensory motor, was elevated in the cell body, any one was not. Plenty of things and all of those that things and few those are present in that. So don't get me wrong, everything is not stuck in the cell body, but some of it is stuck without any change in alpha four levels, protein levels, or RNA levels. Okay? And if you overexpress now, it will suppress. It means you're making more and more better because you're not able to improve more. Okay, when you do an immunoprecipitation, you don't really know if one protein is touching another protein directly or if it's, you know, if, if there are other proteins in between. So the, the, the more similar explanation to take is that it's present in a complex of other things. There must be there must be something that yellow could be one, two, three, five, zero. It could be. We haven't done this experiment, so I cannot comment on it. I just say this is the this is the most conservative way of showing your IPD. Okay. So what the main conclusion is that it is important for correct trans uh, trafficking of synaptic vessel and proteins. It acts with graph one. We think in the cell body, possibly in the body, in making sure make the right size particles which contain the right elements. And I think what was interesting for us is that we watch a very interesting phenotype where we see consistently accumulation in cell body. I'm not saying that I mean I think it's an interesting possibility to consider because we see it in now two other cases that elevation of consistency in cell body without changing overall levels of protein or RNA could be important for a important signature genetically for identifying additional transport papers. Okay. No questions. I quickly move to the next section. You already heard parts of it. So this was a purely genetic study, right? So you now exited the cell body, you made the right sample, you attach to a motor. If you don't do that, possibly the motor can accumulate in the cell body a little bit. It still goes out, but it can still accumulate a little bit. Now you have a cargo complex that entered the axon, and you want successive motion, right? And this is where we were able to take advantage of the CRP system and do some in vivo cell biology, looking at the touch neurons, which is amongst the largest neurons, it's relatively efficient, you have the means to manipulate the microtubules exclusively in this neuron, and you know, you know the length, you know the diameter. You know, numbers of microtubules, you just have a wealth of data which is already done largely by the child. Okay? Or the other things are going wrong. So, in trying to set up a good imaging system, we actually found that we found there were some artifacts that we needed to take care of, which we did using microfluidic devices that we developed. And I'm going to show you a movie, slightly longer movie, which I already showed in the workshop or school. school where we take an animal which is swimming around, hold it in place temporarily, and then look at synaptic vesicles going through the synapse, coming back from the synapse, the marker, not synaptic vesicles, presumably, some are stationary, some are consensually, some don't. It's really active, it's really active. There's a lot of vesicles moving, right? Okay, 
And you can get lots of information. For instance, you can see that as development occurs, the magnitude of numbers occur to increase, the number of vessels moving in the activated direction increase, the number of vessels moving in the retrograde direction don't really increase very much. So you can then look at motor movements and you know the motor movements you're not able to find cargo and make deductions about things like you know, if you count a certain concentration of motors in the surface, you can have largely processive motion. And you can get displacement versus time graphs, which are called time graphs, and look at these time graphs for motion in both anterograde and retrograde direction. And Gautam has already gone through it. You see vessels that move persistently in anterograde direction. Here's the touch neuron. We also see the double neurons and the motor neuron. Here's the vessel so that stops, it moves, and things stop here and there. All kinds of things can be pointed. Just a quick reminder, these vesicles are very crowded, and as Dalton said, vesicles move in both directions. So you have anti-grade as well as kinesin, retrograde as I've shown in my postdoc, is some of these synaptic vesicles were carried by the dynamic motor. And what we saw when we introduced stationary cargo is that the motion of dynamic, the activity of dynamic, was very important for getting collisions and making short stationary cargo. So when you remove that, you have fewer short, short length stationary cargo, but your long length stationary cargo will not greatly affected. When we looked at vesicles that were labeled from the synapse and going back to the cell body, we saw the same thing that for transport and having cargo that were not moving had contributions both from the anterograde moving tool but also from the retrograde. Then Gautam did a lot of modeling with our data, which we are very excited about, driven by this parameter. And what he first showed us were kind of things like Right? Vesicles collide with each other and have short and stationary cargo. What's missing? What's missing is this long lived vesicles, which are present in one location and not going anywhere. Right? So our initial, our initial model did not capture them. So clearly, there was much more happening in vivo than was accounted for in this model. Now, I'm not saying that the model explains in completion what, why these long and stationary examples are present, but it gives us a way of thinking about it. And the way to think about it is we to be able to get long and stationary examples in these kind of graphs by assuming that a vesicle that came and collided <coughs> with other vesicles or came in the proximity of mitochondria, when it came close to something like that, it said, oh, there's a giant roadblock in the road, so now what am I going to do? I'm just going to have less probability of taking my next step to go ahead. Right? So when you put that in your muscle, you start to see big accumulations of carbon along him on this on this kind of graph. So what does it tell you? It tells you that there can be good communication between experimental data and modeling, and modeling need not explain everything by experimental data, and here's one possible way that you can explain long extension cargo, but by no means can you claim that you have understood where they come from, except to say that microtubules are very important because in the absence of reduction of microtubules, long extension cargo is really drawn. We don't see any pattern that jumps out. I think that would be the fair thing to say. It's present throughout the neural process, it's present in all neurons we have looked at, it's present in multiple different samples. We don't see a pattern. But, but they do deform in the same location. So I sort of think of it as micro heterogeneity in that one. I don't know if I'm right. I mean, the other way to see one possibility is that we don't see it because we are looking at just that sum. What if we were to look at those methods uh, in relation to the uh, synapse? That's a great question. In fact, I just gave uh, you know, just the station card point to talk in ASDP. And Kang Shen was there, and he, he, his claim was they were proto synapses. 
Um, in this particular neuron, this process that we're looking at has no axogenic potential. The neuron that Jim looked at and Han Chen looked at the most, the entire axonal domain has axo, you know, synaptogenic potential. So that puts me to, in this case, I'm not very sure. Okay, so that, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. And one, in fact, I started off my book of wanting to look at that very good time and my set of observations pre had some mutants which suggested they might be very good. Tina Tyler and some of the time. Why might you want to know how to back this? Like, he's a one and there, there is a very interesting possibility that if I want to lower your mitochondrial synapses, right, that's one. If you want to send away your bad cargo and replace it with good cargo. The way I, I don't know what I'm talking about, but just kind of talking about the way you place the synapse, where you want to take away things from the synapse, is the synaptic area in your mitochondrial cells. It's not, it's not large. And transport, at least the synapse particles, is constant. So you probably need a balance of entropy and retrograde just so that you don't swell up your synapse with too much power. And in fact, if you look at dynamic systems in the you know, you just see that your synapse is not accumulated a lot of power. I don't know if it's bad, but in the case of my country, yes, an experimental way to assess this, I don't know if you can tell you more, but um, there ought to be a greater access to that synapse in that than when it's active. So, for instance, for my mitochondria, a million years ago, we inhibited how it goes with the other one, and it shifted the balance of mitochondria at more work of three years, since you weren't showing that as much. I wonder if you've got a retrograde flow that's meaningful in terms of retrieving excess or unreduced natural testicles. Perhaps if you had a more active synapse, you could have an increase in that retrograde flow. If you had a less active synapse, you might see an increase in that retrograde flow. That's, that's, that's a very good point and a question that I'm interested in. But to really address that problem, then you need a way to label really what's coming from the synapse to finally have it actually going. It's not tremendously robust, but it works. So now you deliver food coming back from the synapse. Because when you look at any part of the action, that vessel that you're looking at, you really don't know what that identity of it is. All your maps are actually going to be marked. And you can see both in one direction or other. But it could be something which is why the patient has to change the world from antigate food to retrograde food, and now start to move it. Right? So this is why you need to be able to mark the cargo as you can and track the well. Do they go to the cell body? We haven't tracked one from the synapse all the way to the cell body. That is the general idea. That is do go back to the cell body. So presumably they sort of they are endosomal in nature, they go back to the cell body, fuse with the light source, or do some scientific sampling of their content, of their membrane. And the new one. Okay, so these stationary cargo, and this is why again it's important to be able to mark vesicles from the synapse. These stationary cargo has an interesting property where if you look carefully at this beach recovery experiment, you can find the majority of the vesicles moving in the direction of the stop. That tells you that tells you that there's regulation, local regulation of transport at stationary cargo. That's exactly what I said, that you don't know that. So when you look at, say, a marker, you don't really know when you're imaging a picture of the axon whether that has intravertebrate character exclusively or retrograde character exclusively. Because you're not marking the context, you're just making a map protein on the map. So if you want to look at those foods, you have to label the content which is coming from the synapse along with the content that's coming, probably all of them, which has coming from the cell body which you can't distinguish and say where it is. Yeah. 
You could, but they're very small, right? I mean, even if, even if so you can see some of those efforts of ours with mitochondria, see what exchange you have, but they're larger organelles. These very small organelles, it's hard to know if you're mixing because it's still under the transmission of that. You would see something photocondroid, you might even see something which looks yellow, you know, the green and yellow present together, but you don't know if they're same or different. You, to do that, you don't have the resolution that you need. So that's a technical limitation. Mitochondrial labels? Yeah. Gender? I wouldn't know. Teacher? Has, has anybody used labeling? Say, for convertible uh, rice and milk. So, specifically for the convertibles, like the synapses and the fat. I don't know if I've had several of our family in other contexts, including the fat. So, but you know, so many more Hemiusin based motions stop at station cargo and see, you know, diamond the motion don't. Okay, so, and you see that any time of a diamond driven motion like a synaptic principle in Drosophila, you see that they stop less and that's probably because diamond can sidestep and move backwards and therefore it's the motor cycle or right side. It is a much more versatile motor which can carry car for fast blocks, is the way I think about it. I don't think it's the only explanation, but that's a reasonable explanation because when we look at dynamic movements, we actually find that this regulation breaks down. So, when, so, what, so what was the question? How is processes <coughs> maintained in the atom? We don't have an answer to that, but you see some interesting cell biological things. Notably, the conversation in cargo, they act as local roadblocks. They seem to arise from collisions by dynamic and collisions between dynamic and smooth and motion, acting as an involvement, mitochondria involvement, and so, you know, we see that, I think we don't know what it is. We'll be very honest. We don't know what it is. The idea that Gauss uh, of reason is found is that they might be too close. Okay. So we've gone from the cell we've gone into the asphalt. Beginning to uncover different parts of the puzzle and end it finally comes the synapse very, very, just two or three slides talking about what happens to the motor in synapses. Okay? You have the motor cargo complex, it comes to the synapse and you know, does it just let go of its cargo and then just go away. Right? So, again, here to address this question was why, was one of the reasons why it was the pressure screen using the cargo binding defective. A good defective motor, and I'm not going to show you tonight. I'll just show you um, show you one um, cell biological find. So, driven by the allelic series that we got, which in vivo could tune cargo binding, that is, how much motor you were able to attach to the cargo, we were driven to this hypothesis that has been around in the literature, showing that motors come to synapses, possibly let go of their cargo, and get deflated. Okay, so there's the whole in the field. You have a motor cargo complex, you obviously have carbon release, for instance, in the G when GMK is being, uh, which is, you know, it's got really shown what happens to the free motor. Right? So I think the Ron Strong, um, Hero Club, and of course many, many other people have done experiments and they reviews which propose that the free motor is diffused and back to the cell phone. But I think the Ron had shown by doing crush injury that much more motor was coming towards the synapse and much less was coming back to the cell body. Similarly, Hirokawa had done these crush injuries in looking specifically at different motors and made similar observations. And one way to explain, not the only way, but one way to explain it is that you have pools of motor that go to the synapse and they get chewed up. It could be just that the motor comes to the synapse and gets chewed up, or what a genetics seems to suggest. Is that it might let go of its cargo and three motors to that. Okay? And so, how did we test that? We tested that by blocking the duration of the genetic means. And what we see is here what you're looking at is the touch neuron synapses, the part of the axon in the cell body. And you see that when you block the duration, the amount of motor really goes up very 
Okay, and then you come back again to something like an act of elevation acting, showing how are the poles of motion moving in both directions. And this is something I've been trying to be very long. I'm very grateful to my collaborative council for helping us set this assay up. We couldn't look at classic libation acid, but we could look at the current acid. We just cut the neuron. And what we see is that when you cut the neuron in the right hand, a lot of motor, in fact, it's either clear or closer to this gas, a lot of motor comes in the anterior direction, very little motor comes back. When we block the activation, much more motor begins to come back, and we now quantitate it, and we know that you know, a fair amount of motor can come back if we block the activation. So, and we also did that by, you know, uninjured axon, photo means recovery. So what we learned from this last study is that the kinesin tree is degraded at the natural tree with oxygenation, possibly out of power release, as the photodynamics are not showing you today, quite well. So what? I think it might be important, and this is a little bit of a stretch, but I think it's worth considering, that it might be important because you do not want the energy Motor for such an abundant power to hang around the surface. Because they could compete with the rest of the water, much like what Ruth talked about, and therefore enable retrograde moving power, which needs to leave the synapses to come back. That's a bad outcome. That oh, so, so okay. We, let me just I'll address that. Okay. So let me just what I, what what's happening is nothing there is overall synthesis is not being taken. What I'm proposing over there is possibly the motor is not efficiently being used. Okay, so that's why it's equivalent. Here is at the end of the journey. Started your journey with the cell model. You come to the end of your journey. I'm asking at the end of your journey where you put your family deliver your plan to the school. I mean, a lot of the water is going to come attached to the cargo. Some of it is going to come to, through diffusion. Does it all come through diffusion? There's no, you know, we don't know. Right? Obviously, a lot of the motor leaving the cell body is going to be attached to the cargo. So, our story so far, summarizing it, is we've discovered a little bit of the regulation. We think we've got a little bit of a uh, beginning to get an understanding of what might be happening in the cell body. We have to make the right sense for carrier to recruit motor, and possibly if we don't do that, maybe to accumulate motor in the cell body. Process in motion in actual is obviously very important, and stationary cargo actually you might be doing something interesting, it's acting as local regulators of transport. We need to do a lot of work to figure out what they are doing. And then finally, when you come to the synapse, the, the motor of cargo complex dissociates, you think the motor is chewed up, and now you have retrograde moving cargo, which can move back to the cell body in, 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 a, you know, in an uninterrupted manner. So we need to Okay, so somehow it's not changing. So you need to thank the people who did the work. The suppressor screen was done by me initially and then by Jason for my students. Uh, because the uh, health was showing that motors were degraded at synapses, as this Chita did a critical standardization of the um, of the abstractly assay. Uh, he also did all of the SST work. So he was a postdoc who did the microcritics. And the station part of the work was done by Corselia and Dr. did all of the modeling plans, a lot of back and forth. And these are all of the answers. Thank you. Yes, that's a that's how we did the experiment. We had red mitochondria and green vesicles, and that's how we knew that right next to 98% of the vesicles, you had either short or long gestational cargo. Suggesting that when you have such a large object in the axon, it sort of predisposes you to sort of at least temporarily have vesicles that stop. 
All right, I am okay, I'm not on remote. So I think now it's time for break. Maybe 15 minutes? 15 minutes, come right.